We're a business that focuses on putting well-being and performance at the heart of a business's DNA, and we do it in an old-fashioned style. Um, we don't do it with technology, which I think is rare for this forum. Um, and we th we're really in the business of trying to create a revolution in organisations um, from the ground up. Like any good revolution, it starts at the, at the ground level. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why that's important. Uh, and then I'll hand over to Chris to give you an example. We're actually going to talk a little bit about exercise um, and challenge thinking on that. But uh, without further ado, we seem to have lost our formatting, but I don't think that's important. Um, we don't want well-being and health to be sacrificed on our career journey, do we? No. I think that's a, that's a marked change from a few years ago when I think people were pe prepared to flog themselves to death to an end goal. And certainly the, the, the younger generation than, than us, um, the millennials, uh, as they're called, uh, don't want that and aren't prepared to sacrifice their life for an end goal. Um, so uh, that's one very good reason, I think. But the other reason is there is a massive opportunity to business uh, in closing the gap that has developed between us and our environments. We, as human beings, no longer fit our environments, largely due to technology, actually. Um, if you go back um, 10,000, 20,000 years, Chris will allude to this um, when he speaks, um, you'll find a brain and a physiology that, that, that really did fit its environment. And we haven't evolved, actually. Our brains and biologies still fit that environment. And of course, the environment we inhabit is incredibly different. And it's really interesting with the advances of Alexa that I was thinking just a few weeks ago, you know, before Christmas, before Alexa was launched, that we could actually exist with just thumbs and index fingers these days. But now we don't even need those. So where does that take us? Um, so there's lots of reasons. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that gap and how that's developed. And our mission as a business is to close that gap for people, both individually and as businesses, because the way we're, the way we're growing and, and the world we live in, the business world we live in, is so complex and, and a constant state of change. We know that. It's well documented. Um, that we have to be able to think in a different way constantly in order to stay ahead. And we're, and we're just not able to do that if we allow ourselves to simply slip into this environment that we've created. So when we think about corporate culture, again, we've got an opportunity. The rise of corporate culture has meant that uh, this is on people's agenda. Um, people think of purpose. It's a, it's a really well-flogged word these days, isn't it? A purpose and values and behaviours and now relationships. And, and interestingly, we see that what motivates us at work is now exactly the same as what motivates us at home. Um, we, we expect the same things of our work environment. But at CHX, we look a bit deeper than those big headlines, and we look at habits. Because fundamentally, habits are what make or break a business, right down at the grassroots level. And that's where we focus, is if we can change the habits of an organization with regard to performance and using well-being as a tool to close that gap that I described, then we can really unlock the potential of everyone in that workplace. So we work with businesses rather than individuals, but it applies whether you're just thinking of yourself or, or thinking of your business. Um, those days have gone, and we no longer work to Friday at 5 o'clock and celebrate because it's Friday night. Well, we still do that, of course, but it's not the reason we go to work. Um, and actually, this, this phrase, excuse my, I am a Luddite when it comes to technology, as you can see. But I've got a lovely quote here, which, which for me uh, describes the work-life balance thing really well. It's all about, so someone said this, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I won't ask you to guess, because I don't think you'll get it. But um, it's all about quality of life and finding a happy place between work and friends and family. And I just want to prove that that, that as a concept, work and life balance, is, is long out of date. Uh, we no longer have a life and work. It is all one thing. And the reason we know that phrase is out of date is because he said it. Um, 
So we just don't believe well-being can sit in, in the benefits bucket. You know, in the 80s, we had perks. Do you remember that? Perks? I remember that. <laughs> perks, and then that became... Uh, benefits in the 90s, and now we have total reward. And total reward is, is what we get paid, and it's... Um, taxable. Yeah, yeah, it's, ta it's all taxable. Uh, even your health insurance. We've got gym membership subsidised. That's fantastic, isn't it? So, so that's preventative for us ever becoming ill, which means you know, our, our employers all benefit hugely, and maybe we do a bit as well. Um, and then we have medical insurance as well, because if the preventative cure doesn't work, then at least we've got that safety net in place so we don't have to miss work. And this is what benefits menus are. You know, we go and work for a new employer and we get given a list of things we can pick and choose, and how wonderful. Um, but actually, it, it's got to go much deeper than that. And the only way you can truly make health and well-being a part of a company's DNA is to empower people to can take, take control. And the only way you can empower people, as we all know, is to share knowledge, which is why in setting up this business, we recruited the leading research academics in, our, in these sciences um, to become part of our core team. Um, but none of them could come today. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm actually going to come back to that. The table football, how many people have a table football? In, uh, you know, this is one of the perks that we get given to entice us into the workplace. Actually, that's not as daft as it looks, table football, but um, oh, we'll come back to that. Um, so in the age of information, ignorance is a choice. I mean, that, that is fundamentally what we're led to believe these days. But in, actually, in the case of well-being and health, it's not the case, because there is so much information out there, so much misinformation. You know, if you pick up the metro this morning, there will be something on sleep. Um, it seems to be very fashionable these days. And actually, the only way you can, you can get a balanced view um, of sleep is by getting real, real science, get, get to the bottom of what, what really sleep is about and link it to the other three pillars that make up what we call your personal ecosystem. So when you think of well-being, that's what we call your personal ecosystem and it's everything that you have contact with and it's your life, it's your home, it's your family, it's your commute to work, it's your workplace, it's everything and there are four pillars that support you functioning fully uh, right across the spectrum of those things. Sleep, motion or exercise, as we're going to talk about briefly today. Nutrition or energy management, as we refer to it, and your environment. And by environment, we mean this, the stuff you touch. We mean your seat on the train, your, your home existence and your workspace. And if we can get all those four right, that tiny sweet spot in the middle is where you perform at your best. But the, all four need to be in unison which is why in setting up the business we recruited um, a professor of clinical exercise science who's a performance psychologist, a professor of cognitive anthropology, um, um, a postdoctoral researcher in sleep at Geneva University Hospital, um, and various performance nutritionists because we wanted to unify these sciences, bring them together in one place and cut through all that bullshit that is reported constantly in the press. That's just one headline I picked up on a Sunday times about two weeks ago, the myth of eight hours sleep, and I thought, oh no, someone else who's debunking eight hours of sleep, and went into the article and it actually didn't talk about it at all. It was, it was just one of those headlines that was designed to grab you and think, phew, I sleep for five hours, I don't need to worry about it, and actually when you read on, there was nothing of value in it whatsoever. You know, we think sleep is a new science, and people have really only been talking about sleep recently. It's not. In fact, this bloke, um, 200 years ago, said um, six hours for a man, seven hours for a woman, and eight hours for a fool. So there you go. Eight hours for a fool. So he probably got it closer to the truth than the Sunday Times did. But so what's in it for business? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Um, if we can close that gap between us and our environment, I start to operate and function effectively to suit what's around us, and by that I mean um, biologically um, and psychologically um, we are designed to respond to situations and environments and situations in a certain way. And the classic example and the most obvious is our stress responses to things. So the stress re response evolved to, for us to jump out the way of rampaging animals. Um, and nowadays, of course, uh, it's buses. Uh, 
um, but an awful lot of other things that keep bosses. us at and bosses <laughs> and, uh, and keeps us at an elevated level of stress in our lives that is just not sustainable. So how do we get that under control? And actually, you really need to look at all four pillars that make you up to be able to deal with that effectively. You can't just say, I'll cut alcohol out or I'll try and sleep for a bit longer. It just simply won't work. So when we cut through all of that and, um, and look at why we spend most of our time just meeting with businesses and talking about how they should, they should take control of helping their people have a full understanding of how to take control of their lives is because the knock-on benefit is, of course, increased performance um, and increased happiness at work. Um, there is nothing like having everything in place and going to work in a motivated straight state of mind, because obviously motivation is an intrinsic and uh, implicit thing. Um, but the results that you can achieve as an organisation are extraordinary with a fully motivated and switched on team. So, bit over to you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Shall I take, shall yeah. I take that? Thank you. Damon, can you remember where we, uh, where we met? <laughs> Running a marathon? It was, wasn't it? Yeah. Running a marathon. Yeah. What did we do afterwards? A few pints of Guinness. A few pints. <laughs> a few years ago. This was a few years ago. About this was 20 years ago. We met running a marathon. Which seemed quite logical at the time. You know, you kind of, you run marathons, you go to the pub. Um, it seemed logical at the time because both of us were in the fitness industry, uh, which is an interesting industry, and I'm going to probably allude to some of the more interesting points uh, in the next what, three or four hours, is it? Um, ten years ago, however, sorry, my voice went there, ten years ago, um, Damien took me somewhere slightly different to a marathon. He took me up a mountain in Chamonix, hence the name of the business. Uh, I, at the time, was quite a good athlete, I would say. I spent most of my time training, eating well, exercising hard, measuring absolutely everything. Every data point in my life was measured and written down. So we went up a mountain. It wasn't a particularly hard mountain. It wasn't a particularly high mountain. It wasn't really a mountain. I, I found out afterwards, <laughs> sitting in the pub... It was it was yeah, it was, it, it, yes, it was a minor, minor <laughs> undulation in the foothills to the Alps. Um, I was expecting to go up this thing like a mountain gazelle, leaving these guys in my wake. Uh, what actually happened was I went up in something like a slug, um, and these guys slowly, as we went up, had to take more and more of the stuff that I was carrying to the point that by the time I got to the top, I was in this sort of fairly humiliating sort of position of being the only person not actually carrying substantial luggage um, and needing, I think you actually had to take my hand and pull me up the last bit of the, the climb. But something kind of extraordinary happened. And I still don't know what it is, but I spent the last 10 years as a, I'm a sport and exercise scientist. My PhD is in sport performance psychology. Most of my work is, in, is at the interface of physiology and psychology. So I look at the way the brain and the body um, interact. Now my brain and my body interacted in a very, very, very odd way on that mountain. When I came back down that mountain, I may, well, I may have actually only gone up a little minor foothill geographically and physically, but I'd gone up and come down a mountain emotionally and psychologically because I came back from that. And something had changed. I wasn't quite sure what it was. And I'd spent the last 10 years trying to work it out, uh, both as a person and as a scientist. And fortunately, about two or three years ago, Damien, myself, and Lyndon, who's here as well, started discussing the way we could integrate the science of what had actually happened into the business we now run. And a key part of it is this little word here, which means, and it's a little word, but it means an awful lot to a lot of people. It means a lot to athletes. To an athlete, fit is absolutely everything. It means a lot to the NHS, to medicine. Doctors tell us, oh, you need to get a bit fitter. It need, means a lot to organisations. We want to fit, we want fit colleagues, we want to fit <coughs> a fit operation. So fit kind of means a lot of things to a lot of people. And when we think of fit, we tend to think of these types of images, this, this idea of purposeful activity, focusing on a certain understanding 
of fitness. We've lost our titles. Yeah. yeah interesting. No, it's not the company. No, there we go. And when we think of fitness, we tend to think of concepts such as energy as well. And if you Google, and I love Googling the word energy, because energy is a fundamental part of who we are, what we are. But energy is apparently this very often. You, to be energetic, you have to be leaping down a West, West USA beach, normally wearing lycra, normally tanned, normally draping some strangely brightly <laughs> coloured thing. <laughs> Behind you, in a completely unnecessary fashion, um, it's an outward display of energy. It's actually very poor use of energy. Humans, Damien alluded to this earlier, humans, we, we are actually, we're energy storage devices. Every cell of our, every, every strand of DNA is there to actually acquire and store energy. Then we've got these people running down beaches, throwing it away. Um, <laughs> But this is a misconception. This, isn't, this is not energy. This is an outward display of energy. This is an ostentatious display of energy richness, of energy wealth. Now, we've got a guy here sitting. I suspect he's probably, in, I don't know, it's hard to say what he is. He looks like he might be in a lecture theatre in a business meeting. But interestingly, that's energy as well. What we've got there is a lot of energy, chemical energy, being converted into mechanical energy, into heat energy, into kinetic energy. What we've got here is a guy concentrating, he's thinking, he's probably using his memory, he's probably, he's engaging on a number of cognitive and emotional levels. And to do that, he's using his brain. And his brain, surprisingly, his brain is 2% of his body weight, but it uses 20% of his daily energy. So the brain is extremely active. So this, this, this picture is about energy as much as this picture is, and that's important. Now, this picture is also about fitness. This lady is fit, isn't she? And uh, let's, let's use the term fit as in the ability to, to perform as, in, uh, as opposed to some of the other connotations, gentlemen. I saw, I, saw, I saw the grins, I saw the grins. I won't point any fingers, but um, so that's fit. We don't think of that as being fit necessarily. But this is fit because the organism, the gentleman, and the environment are matched quite nicely. Now Nicole made a good point earlier, you said something about square peg and a round hole, and I'll come to that in just a second. But square pegs and round holes is kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about fitness. What, what do we have there? A polar bear. Polar bears, for some reason, sport and exercise scientists, and particularly sports psychologists, always end up with images of polar bears in their presentations. It's a weird thing. But what we have here is a polar bear, very small ears, lots of fur, small extremities. Heat doesn't get given off very easily. Um, lots of fur. Very, very slow metabolism allows it to, to, to maintain, to, to acquire and maintain fat to, 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 to maintain body heat. Perfectly adapted to its environment. It fits its environment. What we have here is a polar bear in a less than auspicious environment for a polar bear. Polar bears do not fit that particular environment well. And in fact, if we took, if we could have a polar bear Olympics, if we could take the world's fittest polar bear from the North Pole, take it down to Florida, for example, and set a, a competition in Florida, the world's fittest polar bear at the North Pole would probably be the world's least fit polar bear at this site in Florida, because fitness is about the fit between you and your environment, between you and your world. It's about that. It's about being a round peg in a round pole, not being a round hole, not being a square peg in a round hole. So we have these guys. Are these guys fit? Yes. Why do we think these guys are fit? Why do, we, why do we kind of describe these people as fit and perhaps not this image as fit? Well, we describe these guys as fit because in their environment, which requires, what does it require? It requires speed. It requires fast reaction times. It requires the most obsessive devotion to training, eight to ten hours a day for eight, nine, ten years before you get to that level. It requires a single-minded focus. It requires a number of things. They fit their environment very well. So they are very, very fit in that environment. So is he. Is that an image that we would associate with fitness? Is that the classic daily male conceptualization of fitness? You would not want to take this guy on at sumo. No matter how fit you are, none of these guys, none of those guys are going to beat that guy at sumo. Even Usain Bolt ain't going to get close to this guy. Two times world sumo champion. Probably got a BMI, body mass index, of about 45, 50% body fat. Technically, very high risk of all sorts of cardiorespiratory and metabolic diseases, but he's very fit. He's fit because he's good at what he does. He's, he's fit with his environment. He's spot on. 
these guys, does that look, you know, what's wrong with this picture? Um, how fit are they? Well, actually, in their environment, not very fit at all. The lady second from right is not going to go far in those shoes in that particular event. So you kind of see where I'm going and where we as a business are going. If we're gonna, if the, the first thing we're ripping up is the idea of what it means to be fit. Now, fit is actually a word that is used completely incorrectly by most people. Fit biologically means the fit between the organism and its environment. And this gentleman, we could argue, is probably far more fit than that group of people because in his environment, he is functioning very, very well. This gentleman, perhaps less so. Now, this guy, he may be able to run a 32-minute 10K. He may be benching 120Ks. But he isn't fit in that particular environment. So we have, we have a sort of this idea that wellness and fitness and health all overlap. Now, they kind of do to a certain extent, but the areas in which they don't overlap are probably greater. We have this idea, no pain, no gain. Often, when we, when we see this, we see images of, should we say, more aesthetically pleasing images than functionally correct images. We have this concept of no pain, no gain. It came, really. The aesthetics came from the ancient Greeks. Um, the imagery started with the, 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 the aesthetics of, uh, or, or the function of military power. The guys with the physiques like this were often throwing discuses, javelins, wrestlers, whatever they were. They were, they were, they were um, symbols of military force, but they soon became an aesthetic ideal. Um, it's an aesthetic ideal that 2,000 years later inspired a bunch of guys in 1950s, 1960s California who were kind of almost like the middlemen, really. Um, but the aesthetic was still the same. The, the, the focus was still the same. It wasn't about fitness, per se, or about health, or about well-being. It was about aesthetics. It was the aesthetic ideal they were following. And to push the Greek thing just that bit further, it's a Trojan horse. Because the idea of fitness that we live with now the concepts, gyms were mentioned a couple of times this morning, they all come from these guys. And that comes from these guys. So we go to gyms to be fit. Very, I mean, I, I still find it staggering that people make, we, we talk about gym memberships as a as perk, what's the more correct word than perk? Reward. Um, reward. Um, I would see it as a punishment, frankly. Um, you know, you've been very bad, you've underperformed, you're going to the gym this weekend. Um, I remember taking a colleague of mine to a gym once, and he, he'd never been to a gym before. And he stood there, he looked around, he said, what are these idiots doing? Um, which, frankly, I, as someone who was in the industry at the time, struck me as being quite an odd question. Now it strikes me as being quite, a, quite an obvious question. So what we have, we have this Trojan horse. We have this idea that has got into our culture that to be fit we need to be doing certain types of things and it has completely undermined what it actually means to be fit to be well to function well now all of you everyone in this room i can tell looking around you've all got very dynamic brains i can just see um, and those dynamic brains are a function of your bodies because your brain whether you like it or not is simply an organ and it is it requires the same oxygen, blood supply, all of the same physiological processes as do the other organs. So it is important that our bodies function well. Because our bodies function well, our brain, which is part of the body, functions well. And our mind, which is the function of brain, also functions well. But it's not about this. It's not about this at all. We don't often see... <laughs> I mean, I say we don't often see it. I actually took this photo myself. It was uh, unusual. Um, I'm a very brave man. I personal train lions. That's how, you know, it's a real man thing. Um, but you don't often see this. Why? Because lions kind of get on with their stuff in their environment. You know, a lion, it, kinda, it probably frolics a bit robustly with the kids and the wife. It probably chases a few gazelles, zebras, whatever. It sees off a few competitors, has a lie down in the sun if other commitments permit. Um, but it's balanced with its environment. It's not using one part of its environment to compensate for another part of its environment. And what we tend to see with the way people perceive movement and exercise now is we're compensating through doing it. 
We have whole organisations who say, we've got a great wellness programme, a fitness programme. We give free gym memberships. Yes, you do that because you have to because you're actually stopping your colleagues from doing what they would naturally do in their environment, move around. It's interesting looking around the room. People are moving. You're all sitting, but you're all moving. Most of you, there's, there's legs moving backwards and forwards. There's heads moving around. There's shoulders moving. We're born to move. We are natural movers. And what we try to do at CHX is get people to understand movement is powerful. Exercise is a very limited form of movement. Movement itself is extremely powerful. And we help people understand that movement doesn't have to be strenuous. It doesn't have to be measured, quantified. It doesn't have to be something you can, you can communicate on social media. This is another problem these days. If it didn't get communicated, it didn't happen. My other half, occasionally, she'll say, I'm not going to run this day. My battery's gone flat in my Garmin. <laughs> it's like, you know, everything depends on the Garmin. Um, but we live in a culture now where we've, we've commoditized movements so much, we've sanitized movements so much, that we've lost the joy of it. And I can speak categorically. What happened on that mountain, sorry, that, on that, not that mountain, on that slight foothill 10 years ago, was I rediscovered what's in my DNA. We, we evolved not to be athletic hermits, which is what fitness is turning us into, but we, we are social nomads. We move slowly and we do it socially. And we've seen fantastic effects on clients of CHX understanding that process, albeit in the rather beautiful backdrop of Chamonix. But it's been very, very, very powerful. Now, I'm a sport and exercise scientist. Most people like me, trust me, you'll see people like me going to conferences. You never have to ask where a sport and exercise science conference is. You just follow all the people wearing Lycra. <laughs> it's the most biased science ever. Physicists don't kind of work on the basis physics is good. Um, you know, um, but sport and exercise scientists do. So I've, I've kind of turned over the last year. I, I was probably originally a motivational speaker about sport and exercise 20 years ago. I'm now proud to be a demotivational speaker because I want people to understand it's not about exercise, it's not about sport, it's about movement and seeking opportunities, choosing to move basically, seeking opportunities to move because that is where the real value of movement lies and that's at CHX. One of the components, one of our four pillars is around simply challenging the orthodox view that exercise is good for you because exercise is a very, very narrow thing. Damien, I'll hand back to you. Oh, I've got nothing to say. Oh, you've got nothing to say? Mm. OK, well... Yeah, that was uh, Sorry, I good. thought I was going back to Let's you. Let's finish with that nice-looking man for the... Uh, fitness, for the, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, fitness. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>